Welcome to Resource on the Go, a podcast from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center on understanding, responding to, and preventing sexual abuse and assault. I'm Louis Marvin, and I'm a project coordinator at the NSVRC. NSVRC is a division of Respect Together. This episode is part of a series on partnerships that reach and support men who are survivors of sexual violence. Today, Javon Howard is joining me to talk about an example of an effective partnership from when he worked at a local program. Javon is now the manager of Engaging Men Initiatives at the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. Hi, Javon. Welcome to the podcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your work at the Ohio Alliance. Hey, Louie. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you this afternoon. Yes, so I am the manager of Engaging Men Initiatives with the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. Um, My pronouns are he, him, his. I want to make sure I put that in there as well. So my role with the Alliance I mainly do a lot of work where I'm doing the training and technical assistance, providing training and information, resources on how to serve men who are survivors of sexual violence. So that's doing like survivor advocacy training and also engaging men around violence prevention. Uh, I wear a lot of many hats. Uh, So with my role, I do a lot of different things, but mostly, you know, I provide those trainings. I do podcasts, uh, episodes like, you know, you have me here today, and I'm happy to be a part of this one. Uh, Resources to Go is one of my favorite um, ones to tune into. I do uh, public trainings and speaking engagements, uh, helping discuss um, and get the word out about male survivorship. A lot of folks don't recognize that men can be survivors of sexual violence. So I do a lot of uh, public speaking about that. We help create products and resources uh, to give to rape crisis centers throughout the state of Ohio as well. So that's a little bit of what I do with my work. A little bit about myself. I'm a writer. I often refer to myself as a warrior sorcerer. You might hear me say that um, in a couple of different places. You know, I'm an artist. I like to paint. I don't know what else to what else to say about myself. I'm not always very good at answering that question, uh, but thank you for having me here. Thanks, Javon, for telling us a little bit about yourself. And I know I'm a big fan of your work in Ohio. You're doing great stuff there. And I also know that before you worked at the Ohio Alliance, you worked at a local program as an LGBTQIA outreach advocate, and that in the course of that work, you provided services in person at a youth homeless shelter. So could you tell us about what went into providing those services? What was what was beneficial about going to the shelter to provide those services and, and who received those services? Yes, I would love to talk about this. So this was one of my first positions of doing like full outreach with a local program. So the thing about doing outreach is, you know, the main model of that is really like being present and meeting people where they are. Uh, so this, what do I say this? I'm not sure if it's like a service program. I'm not sure which word would be the better way of describing it. But the way that it was designed is that essentially my position was a co-located position. Um, so this goes into a little bit about what best practices look like when we're trying to design partnerships um, such as this one where it is best to meet people where they are. We want to remove barriers for survivors as much as possible, um, especially if we're talking about youth homeless shelters. And so I I want to uh, clarify when we're saying a youth homeless shelter, we are talking about uh, emerging adulthood and emerging adults. So the shelter only served 18 to 24 year olds. So that's the population that we were working with. And so, you know, they're young, uh, many of them were in the shelter because they were maybe kicked out of their home. They were running. They were runaways. Maybe they aged out of foster care. Some of them maybe were in between jobs. They didn't have resources to rely on with family. And so they didn't necessarily have those resources to live independently. 
And so those were the, typically the populations that we were we were working with. And so these folks don't have those resources to get to uh, services if they were experiencing violence. Uh, they may not have known about uh, these type of resources that they existed. Um, they wouldn't know about protection orders. They wouldn't know about how to navigate the court system. Um, these are really young folk. They're folks that aren't connected to these systems, maybe are connected to the systems, but don't know how to navigate them. Typically, you know, we'll give them a phone number to call and they get sent to one organization to talk to, then another organization, another organization. And, you know, many of them didn't even have uh, phones. And so the way that this program uh, was designed was that with this position um, about, I would say, maybe two times a week, uh, I would spend part of my time uh, positioned and stationed at the youth homeless shelter to provide our services that I would typically provide to survivors who are adults with our at the office. Uh, so those services were like talking with folks on the hotline, helping folks navigate the court system, providing support group services, one-on-one uh, -on -one intervention, helping with safety planning, uh, doing like landlord advocacy, all of those things. So rather than folks having to come all the way downtown or navigate and find their way, I was there at the shelter twice a week. And so, yeah, so that's what uh, those services looked like. Thanks for going through that and describing that. And I appreciate you talking about the age, the age range specifically, because sometimes we say youth and that might mean a lot of different things. And so you were working with 18 to 24 year olds. And in the project that I work on, we're talking about, you know, men, so adult men. And so you know, we could maybe think of the group you were working with as as young adults in, in certain contexts too. So definitely a relevant story and, and model for, for the larger project that, you know, we're talking about in, in terms of reaching and, and working with men. And you touched on aspects of the partnership already. And of course, our series, our podcast series that we're doing is is about forming partnerships and you know, what effective partnerships look like in terms of, of reaching and en engaging men. And clearly, of course, in, in order to do that work and in order for our listeners to maybe do something similar in their own communities, you've got to have that partnership in place. So tell us a little bit more about how you got the group started and what just what went into forming and maintaining that, that relationship with um, the shelter where you were doing these um, two days a week going on site to provide these services? Yeah. So partially, the relationship was already established beforehand. Um, so there's a couple layers to how, you know, these partnerships were kind of formed. So the first layer of it was uh, leadership. So it speaks to the importance of the involvement of leadership and involved and having leadership buy-in with any programming and trainings and partnerships that you are really trying to design and implement. None of this really, really would have been possible without the leadership between both of programs, the youth shelter and the program um, I was working at for them to collaborate together at that top end as well, you know, designing the, the position, design, deciding on like how many hours uh, was appropriate for their advocate to be also co-located at another uh, um, agency in position, uh, space. Like who would be the supervisor and report into what, what kind of policies and procedures would be appropriate so that way we're able to provide proper services. And so there's that level of leadership involvement that uh, came into play that was necessary that that kind of happened outside my scope of what I was doing and it was kind of done before I arrived there part of the ways that we put together this partnership was like you know needing you know space where I could actually meet with the the young folk so we had to come together and go through like a tour of the building and start identifying ways that we could utilize different spaces in different rooms. There's sometimes a challenge of maintaining confidentiality. So we have to work together a lot around that because it's small, you know, a lot of, so the way it was like, you know, a lot of them live together in the same building, they were coming and going, but everyone who I connected with, so I would intentionally, when I would come twice a week, try to spend some time with them 
while they were at the shelter, even when I wasn't necessarily like running a support group. Uh, so that's one of the other ways that we've developed that partnership. We started a support group um, as a way of having us stay connected as well. So it's like we designed different specific services that would be necessary. So we have to identify that. Uh, what were the needs that the students, not the students, I'll say students, uh, what were the needs that the uh, the youth were needing and really just like coming together in meetings multiple times. It's good to keep that outreach going, building those relationships, really trying to identify what things we have in common. You know, all of this work is intersectional and overlapping. Uh, what to do when, you know, there are survivors in the shelter and they're also living with the perpetrators in the shelter, you know, like having those type of discussions or how do we, you know, even rearrange or design the way that we have homeless shelters to ensure safety for folks who are there. I hope that answered uh, your question. I'm, I'm sure there's more I could, I could get into. I want to make sure that I, I'm not going off on too much of a tangent. Oh, yeah, this is all good. You, you were sharing such such great and practical tips for um for advocates who who might want to get something like this started in in their community and that's definitely you know a goal of these conversations is for people to hear something and hopefully for that to spark you know an idea of how to how to form a new partnership or how to improve an existing partnership and you know every relationship like the one you're describing is going to be specific to the community that it's serving and so it won't look exactly the same somewhere else but we know that there are lots of things to learn about good examples of, of these kinds of partnerships. So I think everything you're saying is super helpful to probably a lot of different listeners. Well, that's perfect. I wanted to also uh, add that uh, I wasn't the only co-located person at the shelter. Uh, so this, again, like, you know, leadership among like different organizations across the city. So, you know, there was other agencies that were also co-located so they were we would have like some sort of like triage in a sense in a sense like even though we wouldn't necessarily collaborate with, with one another across agencies we all did collaborate together at the shelter and so it made it a really good way of removing practical barriers for folks living in the shelter being able to access services um you can think about that for applying that to any kind of population that might be struggling to come to your building, maybe because of confidentiality, they're worried that someone might see them utilizing your services. You know, what does it look like to build a partnership where, you know, somewhere else that they might go that might feel more anonymous or confidential? So things things like that. Yeah. I love that. that those are all great thoughts. And you said something earlier about, was it landlord advocacy, I think is is what you said one of the one of the things that you provided. Could you talk about what what that looked like? I think that that is something, you know, really exciting to think about in terms of people who are working at rape crisis centers and how they might go about offering that to to survivors. So what what did landlord advocacy look like for you in that in that role? Yeah, so uh, with working with these folks, uh, landlord advocacy, often trying to provide like as much comprehensive safety planning to survivors as possible. So helping them, you know, break leases if they're a part of a lease, you know, helping them get their like a co-signer, helping them figure out uh, opportunities to find housing. At the shelter, folks are already like working with a caseworker or as some sort of social worker they probably were working with to help them do more of that detailed work of finding stable, independent housing for themselves. But as an advocate, you know, I was able to help them navigate some of those systems as well. So giving them some information about like what to expect, uh, how to find and shop for an apartment. Sometimes if folks were maybe at the beginning, maybe living in an apartment, and that's where they experience violence and abuse and the reason why that they're now in the shelter is because they're, you know, seeking safe, you know, safe shelter, um, giving them some tips for safety planning for going back home, safety planning for maybe if they're that person who that they're of their abuser is someone that's living with them, how to get that person maybe evicted, getting protection orders, those that type of nature. 
um, how to talk with their landlord and property manager because sometimes uh, there's I, there's you know instances many instances where there might be violence in an apartment and because you might com complain about it or file a police report or call the police landlords might take that as a problem or issue for their property and they might have they might evict you or break your lease for both parties and so sometimes that landlord advocacy could look like talking to the landlord and explaining to them what trauma is and talking to them what sexual violence or domestic violence looks like talking to them about like the importance of like safety in the home and you know what like those type of things and so Those type of conversations were pretty helpful to provide that type of advocacy when folks were trying to figure those type of things out with their property manager. Hmm. There's so many different layers to it. I don't want to miss anything, but I also want to Yeah. want to pause in case you had any more follow-up <laughs> questions. <laughs> no, that's great. I, I really appreciate that you did that work and that you're you're talking about it in, you know, in the context of, um, yeah, of being an advocate at a rape crisis center. I think there are possibly, you know, some listeners who might think of that work specifically as in the domain of like the case manager, like you said. So I just think that's great to reframe and and to see the role that an advocate from a rape crisis center can can bring to that to that level of advocacy and like you said talking about the trauma of sexual violence as as one way of of providing that advocacy so i i hope that people are hearing that and going wow that's a great idea <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and that's like that was took up most of the what the advocacy would be would be having conversations. You're sort of like a mediator in a sense sometimes. Uh, you know, explaining to the landlord, like, you know, it's like it's not that simple that they're not just fighting. You know, this was domestic violence. And this is what domestic violence is. This is what it looks like. And this is different ways that it shows up. Like, you know. And so, yeah, this is hopefully like folks here that this is a great way to be able to safety plan with a survivor. Thanks. And I know that um, that groups were also part of your advocacy work in, in this partnership. Could you talk about um, just like the structures of the groups? What what do those groups look like? Yeah. So that that year when I was an advocate was the year of support groups. I... had so many support groups I was facilitating at the time. I had the one at the Youth Homeless Shelter. I had a couple at the Justice Center, at the jail. You know, there was the LGBTQIA group as well. So I, that was the year of my groups. Uh, a lot of them were structured very similarly. So the way that I would do it at the shelter, there was about once a week, I think it was maybe Thursday. I think it was like Tuesday, Thursday. We would have the time, I'll have my flyers that I created and set up throughout the um, shelter so folks were aware of the group and the time, uh, what room we were meeting in. And if I had a particular theme or topic that I wanted us to kind of get into, and that would be based off of what I was basically hearing got them gossip about <laughs> or what we discussed in the previous uh, group, I would maybe set the theme around those type of things, so around like consent. around healthy relationships. We would talk about, you know, hygiene and things like that, like whatever that they needed to kind of focus on to help get us into some of the conversations they needed to talk about around trauma. And so I would have those flyers. We'd meet about once a week uh, for about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, I ran it as a peer-led group. And so I would be facilitator to kind of bring the group together. We would ground and center. around the topic. Um, we would do temperature checks. Uh, so it's like, you know, I'll ask them like what the rain cloud was or something like that. And they get them started on talking about things that they had going on um, and what their sun, their rainbow was or the sun, sunny thing was. So thing that's going really well for them, something that's not going so well. And then we start getting into it. And that was pretty effective for them to get talking. Yeah, so I think that's the main structure for it. We facilitated sometimes like more, I would say, informal kind of spaces as well. So not necessarily support groups where we will have them coming together and trying to help them sort of like discuss deep problems and solve problems. But sometimes we'd also, you know, break from that and do more of like a social kind of space where 
you know, they can kind of just like hang out and be more vulnerable together versus like when they're out in the, the greater space where they don't really know each other. They kind of have had like contact with one another in certain kind of spaces, but being able to pull them together to have the social space as well was pretty, pretty beneficial for me to build trust with them, for them to understand me, someone that they could work with. Uh, I also want to note that I was, I think, 23 or 24 at the time when I was doing this. So there was also that level where I had to kind of like connect with them a certain way so they understood me as a service provider and not just um, another person in the shelter. That's really helpful. And I want to make sure I'm framing framing this a little bit for our listeners. You know, we're we're talking about partnerships that can help reach and provide services to men. And I think that probably the services that you're talking about were not gender specific, but in the course of doing this partnership and in the course of having a relationship with the LGBTQIA young people at the shelter, you you were serving people of all genders, including men. And so I, th I think that's a, a really important way to think about this, because sometimes when we're in a space, when we're talking about like, what are services for men? You know, it's easy to kind of consider those as gender specific or like only for men. But no, that in fact does not have to be like that. The groups that you're that you're describing right now, for example, I, I assume were all genders, men, women, non-binary, young people. And so, yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, but like, I, I think that's really cool and intentional that we're like, we're here, we're talking about, you know, working with men, but we're not talking about only working with men or having like a gender segregated space necessarily. Yeah, that's a good observation. Yeah, many of the spaces were open to all genders to join. I think that's something that a lot of folks, maybe they shy away from when they're thinking about designing and building support groups for men is the idea that, you know, these groups can't be co-ed. You know, some rape crisis centers, many rape crisis centers already have some form of support group or ancillary service where they're providing some sort of social space or space uh, for survivors to get together, process emotions, talk about different social emotional learning, healing, connect with uh, each other. Uh, connect to services, uh, that men cannot be a part of those spaces too if women are a part of those spaces. Or folks who are trans can't be a part of those spaces if folks who are cis are in those spaces. And realistically, you know, everyone benefits the most when our spaces are more diverse. You know, we learn more from one another. We see our own humanity better. We see each other's humanity better. We understand that these experiences, although not normal and although prevalent, you know, are not unique, that you're not alone, that there are others who have had this experience, even people that you'd never imagine. Like, oh my gosh, like this person who was there's a man who's big and buff and strong and like looks like he can, he, he just eats weights all day, you know, can experience sexual violence or experience abuse and has his, have his consent violated. Like these things, you know, are myths. Like, so like, yeah, absolutely. These spaces uh, welcome all genders. Sometimes it was just a, a men's only space, but that wasn't necessarily on purpose or set to be that way. So sometimes it was just a men's only space. Sometimes it was just a women's only space. And it's just depending on like who attended at the time. But yeah, I actually found the most success at having men join those spaces when they were multiple genders. And that was at the youth homeless shelter. Uh, despite all the other support groups I had, that was the one uh, where we had the most diversity. Yeah, thanks for thanks for saying that. And Speaking of the other support groups, I don't know. But I know that you, um, your experience doing this group helped you kind of think about new models of, of doing other forms of outreach. And is, are those other support groups what you're talking about? Or, or is, there, is there more to those, like launching those other models of, of doing different forms of outreach? Tell us, tell us a little bit more about that. A little bit. Uh, so it kind of gave, started the like a co-located model of building pipelines between agencies. Uh, so even though, like so I mentioned earlier that we, uh, I was not the only one at that space who was co-located. 
But so although this was removing a lot of barriers for survivors to access services, it also created uh, unintentional barriers on being able to provide services where, you know, we were all going back to different agencies and maybe we were working with one person and I was working with someone who was in a support group. And then we had someone else from a uh, job and family services who was helping them with landlord work, working with this person as well, who's co-located. And then there's their, their case manager who was, you know, working with multiple uh, folks who may not always be present. And so having those barriers sometimes and being able to stay connected to each other and have like a really fully, fully comprehensive uh, way of su su providing services uh, wasn't always there. So the model that kind of came from that was like, what does it look like to build more of a pipeline um, where we aren't necessarily just like guessing where survivors need to go when they call one of our agencies, but we have maybe like a standard practice of like, hey, you are first line of defense of like taking care of these needs for, for someone. And then we send the, you to the next agency. And then we send you to this agency. And then we know that if we need training, we'll call these folks and they have advocates who are able to do that training. And so that ideal world, that's something that we already do. <laughs> and in some degree, we are doing that. But sometimes folks just do not have the capacity with programs when they're smaller. You know, some programs only have like four or five advocates. And so saying like, let's build all these systems between agencies might sound easy and simple, um, but it's not always that simple. But to know like, yeah, trying to build those pipelines where, you know, you have multiple points of contact at an agency. You know, it's not just one person that how you all work together, you're thinking about sustainability so that with someone, the retention is kind of low in our field, you know, sometimes it's between two to three years. Uh, what happens when that advocate leaves uh, and they've been working with these survivors or they've been have, running these support groups or they've been building these programs and developing these outreach pipelines and these networks with other agencies? It's like that one goes away. So does that connection. Does, so does that collaboration. So building that to a stronger foundation of outreach where we like, we know as agencies, we have each other's back and we know how we're going to have each other's back. And so that's kind of like where I started working with that. Um, I was pretty successful at creating those those uh, connections, kind of put me into the, the track of training a bit closer because of what I got my foot in the door by providing trainings. That was my way of <laughs> uh, getting my foot in the door with agencies to build those pipelines. I would call, connect with uh, multiple people and offer to train their full staff on services, and then go from there. Great. So many great things, I think, that many different listeners can connect to, maybe um, a new way of thinking about something they're already trying to do, or I think you're also offering things that a lot of people might be hearing for the first time. So really appreciate you reflecting on that work uh, that you did in your old role and how the partnership wasn't just the partnership. It was all these other things, too it helped build you know, partnerships and relationships with, with more agencies and thinking of s sustainability and those pipelines of outreach. Um, so thanks for, for thinking back and, and walking us through how that all worked and how, how you saw it being effective. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about today with our listeners? I would want to add to remember that, you know, we all have something to offer. Um, when you're thinking about building partnerships and connections that sometimes we might be discriminatory about who we feel like are able to provide us services, provide us valuable collaboration. And it's good to have discernment and it's very good to like know what your goals are and your objectives so that we're, because time is the most precious currency. We don't have time to just be doing anything and everything. But also to, you know, remember that relationships are the most important thing about this work that, you know, connecting with people is the most important thing about this work and it's our collective humanity. And so all partnerships can be good partnerships. I believe in, and I've been working on this a little bit of decolonizing love. Uh, so essentially that, you know, even if partnerships are not such good partnerships, there is maybe, if there's room for transformation, 
find ways to transform those partnerships because at the end of the day, our mission is to end violence. It is to serve uh, survivors of violence. And so we owe it to them and to ourselves for a better society to allow for that room for transformation when necessary. So relationship building is critical and key. And so, yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to add that. Thanks. I think that's a perfect place to, to leave this conversation. Yeah, th- thanks for this, Javon. This was great. It was really great to talk with you today. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of Resource on the Go. For more resources and information about understanding, responding to, and preventing sexual assault, visit our website at nsvrc.org. You can also get in touch with us by emailing resources at nsvrc-respecttogether.org.